Wow, and big thank you, Pamela, and her family for hosting this. This is a great, great space to hold this. Oh, thank you. So thank you. So hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. hi. <laughs> I was joking earlier that uh, I think a lot of artists, uh, you know, we spend most of our time alone in our studio. So then uh, when we start asking introverts to come out and give public presentations, like, things just get kind of weird. But anyway. Um, so, maybe I'll start out with um, just a little bit of my background, a uh, little bit about the inspiration for these pieces here, um, and then, yeah, we can talk individually, we can have question and answer, um, I think it's pretty informal. So, uh, so to start out, these are three maquettes for what we're thinking of for the John Mead Park. Um, so feel free to come up and they all spin around. Each one of them has a, a different image depending on the perspective you're looking at it from. Um, so I've been a sculptor full time for about 14 years, uh, give or take a few months. Uh, before that, I was an engineer. Uh, after that, I taught middle school. I customized vintage motorcycles, um, did a little bit of everything and kind of landed on sculpture as a place where uh, I think what I really love to do met the world's need. So, um, so now I do it full time and love it. I'm up in Loveland, um, which is, well, one of the big reasons we moved to Loveland about 10 years ago was because of the sculpture community there. Uh, it's, there's a ton of fantastic folks. I can take pieces to two different foundries on my bicycle from my studio. So um, if you haven't been up there, they've got Benson Sculpture Park has almost 200 pieces of large scale outdoor work. It's just beautiful. Um, Actually, one of the projects I just finished up up there was, I think you guys have seen the Monarch Girl, it was on the invitation, so that piece is installed in the Benson Sculpture Park up there. Um, I, see, I'm finishing up another project for Tulsa, Oklahoma at a fire station out there. They just dedicated it, so I'll be going out in a couple weeks to put finishing touches on that. Um, now, specifically about these pieces. so. Uh, we went out, was that maybe a month and a half ago-ish, to the park? To the park. Yeah, we talked for a while, we walked around the park. I was trying to get a sense of what, the meaning of the park to the community and you know, what we could do. Because uh, when I do these projects, it, I've got three criteria. Like, one of them is it has to be intellectually engaging, uh, it has to be emotionally resonant, and it has to help the community that it's placed in. It has to have something to do with that community. And I figure if a project fits those three things, then I'm excited to do it. Um, so with these, I was looking at uh, different species that you can find in the park. So uh, specifically monarch butterfly, the broad-tailed hummingbird, and the great horned owl over here. And can you, sorry, can you turn the owl? Oh, I see the child. Yeah, that's what I Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You bet, you bet. Yeah, it's like two sculptures in one. Right? So, um, and I, I picked those three species because I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what do we leave the next generation after us? Like, how do we help them uh, do great things in the world that we leave them? And I, I kept coming back to this idea of resilience. So I, I've got a 10-year-old daughter, and resilience is kind of the theme that we've been working on with her. Like, I hope one day she likes math. Like right now, she kind of likes science, but like if she can be resilient, I, I fear that's the best thing that we can teach her. So each of these species uh, demonstrated one aspect of what I thought of as resilient. So uh, specifically, like with the great horned owl, uh, it's very adaptable. So it can live in old barns, it can live out in the forest where there aren't, you know, there's not as much human interaction. Uh, its diet is pretty varied. Uh, it hunts all through the night, so it can kind of find different ways to eat. Uh, and I thought, well, all right, adaptability is, you know, one kind of flavor of resilience that I'd like to teach. Uh, with the hummingbird, and it, this, this is where I wander a little bit into anthropomorphizing, which makes me a little nervous, but, um, you know, if anybody here has a hummingbird feeder in their backyard, you know how yeah. aggressive those things can be, even though they're so <laughs> tiny. So I thought, well, to me, that part of that is about self-confidence. And you know, if, I can, if we can impart self-confidence to the next generation, that's another aspect of that resilience. Uh, then the monarch butterfly, and this one's a little bit different um, in that 
I was thinking about the theme of, or the aspect of resilience that dealt with interconnection to community. So the monarch butterfly makes an incredible journey from Canada to Mexico and back uh, over a span of years. Uh, and there's a ton of them. And they're really dependent on the, the, the way stations that they stop at on that journey. So can they find places without too much predation? Can they find food? Can they, you know, or is, the, is the weather such that they can actually navigate? Um, so they're very interdependent on the communities they pass through. Uh, and also those communities are very, inter are very dependent on them. So they're a major pollinator. So, you know, Central Valley of California, uh, parts of Colorado, um, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, they all, all those farmlands depend on pollinators, uh, of which the monarch butterfly is one. So I, with those three, I thought, all right, uh, you know, self-confidence, uh, interdependence on community, and then uh, adaptability. I thought, well, okay, if I could, if I could summarize what it would take to be resilient, those would be three of the major aspects. It's not, it's not a collectively exhaustive list of resilience. It's not even really mutually exclusive to each other. Um, but I liked, I liked that it would uh, maybe illustrate a little bit of a path forward about what we hand off to the next generation. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. It's been sitting in my mind for so long when I actually speak it out loud. It's, uh, I just want to make sure it resonates. A couple of the technical details. I, I work in stainless steel, which I found to be really uh, resilient. Um, it's, I've had pieces in California and uh, Florida, Texas, Colorado, Mexico, and the stainless steel holds up really well to all those kind of conditions, and it's really fun to work with. Uh, the paint I use is all uh, outdoor rated. It's got seven, eight layers, including all the primer on it. So it's a, it's a pretty tough covering. Um, I work with uh, an incredible uh, engineer who's based out of North Carolina, who uh, is also a sculptor, but he also does all of my engineering drawings. So we can get all of that you know, settled and make sure that it's actually not gonna fall down that the footings are, are solid enough in place for me to be. Um, yeah, so those are some of the background details. I mean, I, I guess the last thing I, I, I'd leave you with is kind of like my, uh, like my, well, kind of my origins in public art. Like when, when I was a kid, we, well, some of the years I grew up in Dallas and we had a local library that would rent out, well, lend out paintings in addition to books. So, you know, as a little kid, I'd walk in, they had these huge, like, basically metal leaves on mounted on the wall with paintings hanging on those metal leaves so you could you know slide them over like huge book pa pages and pull off a painting that you could bring home so i have this memory of sitting in my parents oldsmobile which is one of those like you know the hood went on for miles it was just this huge <laughs> boat of a car and between me and my brother and sister we would take home a painting like every two weeks we'd have a stack of books and a painting that we'd swap out with whatever we had on the wall and I just love that idea that art was for everybody, that you could have this resource that everyone could enjoy. And that's, you know, it stuck with me over the years, and now it's one of the reasons why I love doing public art, because it's something everyone can enjoy. So, thank you all again for being here. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to talk to folks about questions or thoughts, or, I mean, we can open up to questions now. If, Sure, if anybody has questions, anything or we can just do it. Yes. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about the silhouettes and different angles and the three-dimensionality? What are you trying to show in different dimensions? Right, right. So um, what I do is, uh, after I kind of have an idea of the images I want, you know, so in this case, a little girl and a monarch butterfly, um, I do a lot of manipulation on them with like a computer model to figure out how to place the panels. And these are actually the fourth prototype I've made so far because, um, you know, what something on a computer doesn't always look like real life. <laughs> so and you got to make sure there are pieces that aren't floating and all that. So uh, the general idea is that each image is perpendicular. The planes are perpendicular to the next. So when you're looking at it edge on, it kind of disappears. And then um, as you turn it, the other image appears. So. And so 
how did you choose for each of the three? How did you choose, for example, the girl and the butterfly? I can't see what the other two are, but right, what, right. what was going through your mind in terms of the theme of resilience? So uh, the, all three of the, the human profiles are all children. All human, okay. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, you know, it's, when I think about like how do we leave the world to the next generation, I think of little people. So, uh, and I, I like the idea of all three things that fly and then having kids moving because for those of you with kids, you know, like they go through stages where they're just like these crazy little kinetic objects. Spoken <laughs> like a sculptor. Yeah, right, right, right. And like a dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cleaned up a lot of the messes as a result of that kinetic <laughs> energy. So, uh, and uh, all, all three species are here within the village. Yep. Uh, the monarchs, of course, migrate through, and we do have <clears throat> we do have milkweed planted within John Mead Park to entice the monarchs to come. Yeah. And this will entice the children to come. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one of the, the stories I kept hearing from the commission when we were walking around the park was they, they kept mentioning the, the intergenerational things that happened in the park. So uh, grandparents fishing with kids at the little pier or uh, kids and you know their older siblings playing in that open area out there. So I, I, I can't think of one instance where folks were talking about things that didn't involve kids. So I thought, well, that, that would be a useful thing to include in the, in the sculptures. And with three of them, I mean, we're still kind of thinking about exactly where they, they should go. But I like the idea of visitors to the park and walking through and kind of discovering them. So that's kind of like, a, like an artistic Easter egg hunt. <laughs> you know, because you'll see one and you know, you'll see, all right, it's got these two sides. And here's a baby. You see the second one. And OK, you know, there's a connection there. And the third one, that it feels very cohesive. And to add on to that, so Parks and Rec, and I think Corey might be able to explain it a little bit more, but we have around the John Mead Park, there's a lake, and around that lake, there's three spots that have been approved by the Parks and Rec that we can put these sculptures. So we have three different locations where we can put them. If we put them all in one location or in all three different locations, it's up to Joe and, um, and all of us. We have, didn't have forum for a meeting in October, yeah. so we will talk about it coming yeah. in November. Yeah, but thank it's you. On our yeah, yeah, so we're in the we're we're so we're in the process of, of figuring out how how the how the storyline works and and all that type of stuff and and how to you know have the artist vision really be seen for the community. So. We also have some some limitations as far because we have to get a concrete truck in and. Uh, certain things like that, so we're limited that it's not going to be way on the other side of the park because there's no way to get concrete trucks and that sort of thing in there. So we've taken that in consideration as well, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Just uh, one one little uh, note that I don't know if I mentioned. Each of these we're planning on them at six feet tall, and then okay, and then on top of a, a sandstone slab, so a total height of maybe seven-ish feet. Um, I found that that scale, when it's just about human scale, I feel like it. People can relate to it. You know, if something is gigantic, uh, at least with a human form, I, that always feels a little offsetting to me. Um, and then the the sandstone slab on the bottom will allow, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, landscape maintenance maintenance equipment to come by and weed whack and things like that without actually having to run up against the edge of the sculpture. So there's a a maintenance part to it. How too. wide would it be then? Would you do, could you sort of shape it out for us? What you so, I mean, <laughs> this one, like, uh, I'd say, you know, if it's six feet tall, we're probably looking at, you know, three and a half, well, two and a half feet wide-ish or so. So, too big to hug. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, what kind of uh, paint do you use with, uh, with these, and how long does it typically last and is there a sealant and what's the care? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's uh, three layers of primer that go on, each with kind of their specific job. Like one kind of grabs the metal, the next one grabs that layer of primer, and the next one grabs that primer and the next layer of paint. So it's like a gigantic paint sandwich basically. Um, and then on top of that, there's four layers of uh, a color coat. And then on top of that, there's three layers of a clear coat. 
All of those are a, a two-part epoxy paint that I spray on. It's, it's very similar to automotive paint. Uh, I found that the automotive industry, you know, they've got these cars that are outside just getting the snot kicked out of them with hail and snow and all kinds of things. So, you know, a sculpture hopefully is moving zero miles an hour and uh, the paint's held up pretty well so far. Um, the other great thing about that paint is that as opposed to something like a, a powder coat, this paint, if say a rock gets flung by a piece of landscaping equipment or, uh, you know, something, there's some kind of damage that requires paint repair, you can just repair that one spot on the paint instead of having to pick up the whole thing and haul it off and then reinstall it. So, so are you envisioning them when they're installed that that from the street perspective you'd see the the, the birds or the flying and yeah. then yeah. The, right. you'd only see that perspective and then when you walk around? You know, I I don't know yet. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe yeah, we have a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. If I can talk the art yeah. commission into a couple more meetings out there, you know, yeah, we'll walk sure. out. I think we can uh, accommodate. Yeah. yeah, we'd love to. And then that, that's the great thing about having digital models is that we can take photos and I can rotate them and place them in place so it looks like they're there and we get a sense of like, all right, what's this going to look like at different times of day, um, even different seasons. So, yeah, so I'm not sure yet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. I'll fix the metal. It's a quarter inch. Yeah. The, the one exception might be this one, and this is one of the reasons why I love my engineer. Uh, you know, it's got this, it's cantilevered way out like that, uh, so my suspicion cool. is a couple yeah, pieces package. might need to be a little thicker. Um, but we'll see. It, generally what we do is uh, there's a, a concrete footing that's poured uh, underground that you'll never see. That uh, the stone is then bolted to and then these are bolted to the stone. So for something like this, that concrete footer would be a lot bigger than the other ones to account for that kind of cantilever. Uh, How much do they weigh? So I'm guessing a neighborhood of three to 400 pounds for these two. This one's got a little more material, so it's probably more 500 pounds-ish. What do they cost? <laughs> Can we negotiate? That's the that's the big question. I'll, I'll maybe I'll leave that for the art commission. Kind of, I know they're, they're in. Yeah, we'll turn it over to you, Chrissy. You can yeah. pick it up now. <laughs> I know they're actively working on the finances, so they're they're more knowledgeable about how that works than I am. So, do you have some pieces that are nearby? I mean, where, where are your yep. nearest pieces? Golden, right? Yeah, so, uh, Highway 93 in Golden, uh, between Golden and uh, Boulder, there's three pieces right on the side of the road there. And actually, that was a really fun project because uh, we, were, uh, we were down there with some friends a few years before I got this project. Our kids were running around in a field and there were red-tailed hawks flying above them. And uh, so these pieces are kids from one direction, red-tailed hawks from the other. And we oriented it so because there's a lot of people that commute on Highway 93, so when you're going one direction, you see three red-tailed hawks, but when you're coming home, it's not oh, kids. So, cool. uh, so there's that. There's uh, the, the one up in Benson Sculpture Park. Um, what else do I have around? Uh, I think those are probably the two closest. And you often cite them as multiples like that to see the different perspectives? I, you know, um, it kind of depends on the site. Uh, there's one I put in uh, just outside of downtown LA that's 12 feet, well, 16 feet tall. Um, but the context, it was, it was a space that you could step back far enough to see it. So generally speaking, I found that if you're three times the distance that the sculpture is tall, that's the minimum you want to be at to see it. So if it's a 12 foot sculpture, this place you could be back 36, 40 feet and see it. Um, Pieces like this, uh, I like the, it seemed like the sight lines are more in the 20 foot kind of distance, so that's kind of dictates that six foot height as well. Yeah. So it, it depends on the site. Um, some work really well for multiples. Uh, there's one in Tempe that we were just talking about that's got six pieces out of a big plaza. So as you walk through this plaza, you can kind of see these pieces, and they're all musicians from one direction and coyotes from the other. So they're, they're very much human sized. Yeah. So, uh, 
Have you ever yeah. installed one that's not stationary, one, one that spins? Or you know, I, so I've done a couple of proposals on those. Um, what I've found is that I'd like to, <laughs> is a short answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the cost goes up a lot. Yeah. Um, we figured out how to engineer a base, um, but then there's things like we need a certain uh, mechanism on it, so if the wind really kicks up, it doesn't just start yeah. you know, spinning like crazy. Right. And then there's also a lot of maintenance that you get when it comes to mm -hmm. moving parts. I mean, we're just connect, kinetic sculptor over here. We were talking about that earlier. Um, I think that there's a, a kinetic mangled in the collection yeah, too. Yeah, it is. Isn't there? Yeah. Okay. In our on loan. Yeah. On loan. Okay. Of our, yeah. uh, town hall. Oh, the, yeah. uh, the Gilbert Gil Gil Romero one. Yeah. Does. But that one moves too. Oh, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. That one's yeah. better. Yeah. 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 Not with the wind. No, no, not with the wind. So. No, no, not with the wind. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'm trying to get a better, better idea for yeah. what the relative positioning would be, mm. um, because it it seems if you've got. Uh, two different pictures at 90 degree, de degree angles. Uh, if you're at one, you'd be able to see, say, a child from one direction, and at 90 degrees, you can see the monarch butterfly or the hummingbird or whatever. Mm -hmm. so how do you do that with three as opposed to four? Oh, like uh, if you wanted three images included in one sculpture, or? Uh... This is for three. Huh? How, do you, how do you look at? Uh, in something that's entirely perpendicular with three images instead of with four. Oh, I see. So I, I'm not, I'm not expecting that you'll be able to see all three at once. Um, so yeah, in our particular, yeah, if you're at the home, right. they're, they're, they're not all set. Look over together. there and you can see that child that's that's a monarch butterfly from the other side. Right, right. Um, and then you get there and you can see the owl. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so. Kind of like a. But then um, you couldn't see the other one because it's not a square. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, because you know, right now I can see a partial child mm -hmm. with blue lines in it. Yeah. As opposed to like yeah. Yeah. It's, my it's whole... meant to be circumnavigated. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're meant to be sighted and then. You we walk could around. set these out in the park tonight, but it's a little late. Yeah. It's a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I mean, if you really want to pull people in, yeah, then. You can yeah. see one image, you get close to the image, you see something totally different. Mm -hmm. so part, part of my hope is to make them interesting enough at those intermediate yeah. angles in between the 90 degrees that it will draw people enough to go over and take a look at it. Because um, with, with a, a group of three, yeah, it'd be hard to go. Like, you need four so you can move in a yeah. square, basically. Yeah. So, and that, that's one of the benefits, I think, of. Uh, of just doing iteration after iteration after iteration to figure out, like, all right, this looks great from the two 90 degree angles, but if it's not interesting from that intermediate angle, then it's not a successful sculpture. So, yeah, good question. <clears throat> These sculptures, they're, they're not all over the park. I mean, the park is a good sized park, but most of it is wetlands, and so we with the foundation, there's no way we could do that. So these, these three sculptures are literally about 40 to 50 yards apart, maybe. So it yeah, isn't a huge it. area. Yeah. It isn't, you know. I think the idea is to draw away. people into the park. Yeah. So they, yeah. one will be closer to the road, it'll be more visible. Yeah. And then once you see that one, you can see that there are others. Yeah. If we can have our dream of yeah. having the right. series. Right. <laughs> yeah. That depends on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you so much, Joe. We appreciate that.